Welcome to Designing Cities for All, another episode, and it's part of our two-year-long activity and research program. Where we take a deep dive into designing products, spaces, and systems for all. Just because you feel safe, or you feel welcome, or you feel included, doesn't mean that uh, everyone else around you feels the same way. We don't stand alone, we're not individuals that somehow plan it to an island, you know? And I think that's the beautiful thing, a diverse society that everyone can add something from out of their own change just if we just let things happen. I think if you can uh, build relationships and use design as a tool to build those relationships, the better off we're all going to be. Everything around us was once designed and can therefore be redesigned. <laughs> Belonging is, is a very, very important concept. You can try to take someone's place for a while, but you don't have the lift experience. Let's begin by acknowledging similarity and affinity. Be a person, not your role. I think inclusion is not a choice. Inclusion happens by design or not at all. In order to create truly inclusive public spaces that are accessible to everyone, we have to underline what everyone actually is. Real inclusion, it's got nothing to do with the norm, but it's like something that we create from all different perspectives. You know, so even when we bring everybody at the table, does everybody's voice count the same? Because it's a big question of, of who tells these stories. You know, the more I explore about other cultures, other religions, is the more ingredients I have to make the architecture and to answer the questions I get from society. Not fitting in was a blessing, or I would have turned out just like you. Hello there. What you just witnessed was a, a recap of the first year of Designing Cities for All, the two-year activity program of Pakhuis de Zwijger, in which we take a deep dive into uh, designing products, places, and spaces for all. Welcome to this first edition of 2022. My name is Dimfi Brown, and uh, I'm really honored to uh, present this edition because today is the kickoff of the new fellowship of Designing Cities for All, the fourth uh, the f first of the year, but the fourth in total. Uh, and I'm really happy to announce that uh, magazine One World is the one that is fulfilling this f uh, fellowship. Uh, and we're going to take a, a look at the magazine and their platform today um, and get to know the people behind it. And with me here in the studio, because I'm not doing that by myself, uh, is the editor-in-chief of One World, Sarah Noorsen, and also a uh, designer, Remco Oude Alink. Uh, you are uh, one of the geniuses behind the uh, new uh, graphic style of uh, the renewed One World. And also joining us via Zoom is John Oliveira, publisher of One World. Hello, John. Just wanted to say hi for, to you for a minute. Hey. Uh, we will get back to you uh, in a minute uh, as well, because uh, I want to welcome you to this edition. Um, maybe you're watching online or you're watching uh, via the Pakhuis Zwijger website, uh, joining via Zoom or watching via AT5. Hello, everyone. Um, we're still in a lockdown situation. No audience today. Um, we will be hopefully organizing from next week on programs again with audience in the room. Uh, but for now, that doesn't mean that you can't join us. If you join us via Zoom, you can ask questions. You can find the Zoom link on the program page of dezwijger.nl. Uh, and that's uh, where you can put down your questions. So uh, let us know that you're there. Uh, we will uh, uh, ask your questions to the uh, people in, at the table today. Um, so please join. Um, well, we are here with uh, John and uh, Saada, um, because um, we're, getting we're going to talk about the fellowship and what that includes more uh, later. But first, I want to know, who are you and what is One World? OK, um, so my name is Saada Nursen. Uh I'm a chief editor at One World. Um, what would you like to know? Because it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe? Because we got yeah. a beautiful clip uh, that that actually shows yeah. what one world actually is. But maybe I want to hear it first out of your mouth. What uh, one, yeah, how do sure. you describe one world in yeah, a few so, sentences? Yeah, um, so I think uh, the way we describe it is that we um, we try to uh, make journalism for justice. Uh, that's our aim, at least. 
Um, and One World is an offline and online magazine where we appear daily online and um, every quarter offline, so in deluxe print, uh, which uh, Studio Colorado is one of the designers of. Um, and um, how I describe it is that we are um, a small but very important title when it comes to uh, critical uh, journalism and uh, constructive journalism um, uh, with a um, modern look at what journalism's task should be in society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear a lot about inclusivity and diversity and all those, um, all those uh, catchphrases. Um, but and a lot of media also uh, use those terms as um, you know a way to say what they're trying to do. Uh, but I think we actually, besides the fact that I don't like those words, but we'll talk about that in mm -hmm. another uh, mm -hmm. episode. Uh, but uh, we actually try to really perform uh, instead of uh, making it a goal. It's part of our daily practice. Yeah. So, so not only covering stories, but also. Uh, looking at the structures behind injustice Definitely. and acting according yes, to those Yes, and I, um, I once uh, said in a, uh, I think it was a guest lecture at a university in Canada or whatever, um, I said that, it was, I, I thought that was kind of smart <laughs> of myself, but just to, to show what we're doing, like we don't cover incidents, we uncover systems, that's mm. what we're trying to do. So may it be, uh, you know, this system of politics or the system of... Uh, you know, companies um, or, or the systems of society, but also the systems of media. So one of the things we try to do when talking about redesigning journalism is that we try to change the norms uh, in ways of working so that media doesn't contribute to injustice, but instead of it, you know, fights injustice. Yeah. So that's why I call it journalism for justice. Um, so that we also look at the flaws within journalism, uh, within media, uh, that uh, contribute to oppression, that contribute to uh, making some people heard and some not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also without um, uh, exception of ourselves. Yeah. So uh, self-criticism. So self-criticism, yeah. yes. Well, um, you mentioned already like design flaws, et cetera, in the world of journalism. We're going to take a look at that uh, later on. But uh, let's start a clip first that explains uh, one world and also shows some of the visual identity already. Sure, yeah. It is time for more than news. Time for new verhalen over mensenrechten duurzaamheid en identiteit. Dichtbij en ver weg. Want onze wereld kan en moet rechtvaardiger. Dat is misschien geen nieuws, maar wel nieuwe journalistiek. Het is tijd voor One World. Word nu abonnee, lees je bewust en vertel het door. Ja, yeah, so covering topics like human rights, sustainability and uh, identity. Identity, yeah. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John... <coughs> I want to include you too, because uh, One yeah. World exists uh, 10 years uh, this year. Um, so uh, you're existing uh, for a while already. But uh, you have been involved uh, not the entire 10 years, um, but you <laughs> haven't actually. You started in 2018. John joined last year. Uh, John, can you uh, tell me a little bit what One World means to you? Um, well, um, to be exact, um, in December last year, uh, One World uh, uh, had its anniversary for 10 years. Um, I've been um, involved for now three years, I believe, uh, after, to be exact. I'm looking at Sada. Um, yeah, but in a different role. So, yeah. yeah, in a different, definitely in a different role. I, uh, I was a part of the advisory board, editorial mm -hmm. advisory board. And last year, um, we uh, we had the chance to uh, take over uh, in the form of a license. So, um, well, that's that's basically uh, the the role that I have as a publisher. So, um, in 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 essence, um, Sada is uh, the the chief editor, and I'm the publisher. So, I'm more on the business side mm -hmm. and more involved in um, the partners and making sure that um, uh, 
we are in, in line with the, the the business goals that we uh, that we aim, and that we can be sustainable for forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. So your part is the business side. Your part is more the content side. But what does it mean to you personally? Well, um, uh, it's really close to my heart. If, uh, if we're talking about human rights, um, in my, um, uh, I'm, just to give you a, a small example, um, I'm, uh, I'm chair of an, an, a European organization, uh, anti-discrimination organization in football. So uh, it is specific on the topic of human, human rights. Um, and so that's one of the things that I, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I can contribute from, uh, from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're talking about identity, um, what I love is that I'm learning every day. So um, I'm a close reader as well. I'm not reading everything. I should have. But the thing is, um, I love to share because the thing is... Uh, um, because uh, we write about a lot of different kind of different perspectives, yeah. it, it helps me understand the world uh, better. So yeah. that's the things that I'm. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to. Yeah, uh, and I think also the change me. that you are trying to establish together in journalism is something you see in all the different worlds that you are uh, encountering. I mean. I know you have experience in the dance world, in the event world, in advertising, media. Um, so you're, you're right. the it things that helps. you're trying to change are yeah. nothing new, but it's great that you're now focusing specifically on journalism, which has been a quite traditional, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, sector. Sector. Now, the thing is, um, uh, for the last, I mean, the last, I think, five or six years, I've been working uh, in the traditional uh, sector, to be, to be quite honest. Um, and four of the six years, I was um, uh, really busy with a uh, startup on blockchain and journalists. And I, I love to, to, to use all this experience and see if we can uh, get like um, or make one world, well, say, um, more sustainable for the future. Yeah. So, and that's not only to do with new in, uh, innovations, but also to do with events or um, the way that uh, we can work together with uh, partners uh, and not only uh, national partners, but probably international partners as well. So, um, well, we got a lot of dreams. Mm. Seada, um, you have been working in journalism for a really long time. You aspire to be a writer, uh, became a journalist. Uh, and uh, worked for, well, we mentioned some of the traditional media. You worked for those big magazines uh, before. Um, you said yes to uh, uh, being chief editor of One World around five, four, four or five years ago. Why, why did you say yes at that moment? Why because it was yes? a smaller, it is a small independent yeah, title. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a step back. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I don't see it that way, but... <laughs> Some might, some might say that. <laughs> yeah, some might say that. Yeah. Ex that's exactly true, actually. Um, yeah, so I didn't work so at So why did you say yes? Anyway? Yeah, yeah. So I, just to clarify, I didn't work at magazines. I worked for newspapers. Newspapers. Yeah. So I used to work for Trau, which is one of the national newspapers for the longest. I worked at, worked at some other titles as well. Um, so the reason why I said yes to One World uh, was because I think it's interesting to... Um, to mention that, uh, well, as everybody can see, I'm black. <laughs> and um, being the only black person uh, in a completely white newsroom, uh, or almost completely white, we can say it's like, you know, there's been, there have been surveys uh, throughout, you know, there's like this yearly thing, or, or I think maybe every five years there's this research, how many people in media are, you know, uh, of diverse background, mm -hmm. which is a weird phrase, Yeah, that's I a think. weird word. Because Very weird word. I'm yeah. not diverse. I'm just black. Uh, but um, uh, so it's, you know, it comes down to around 95%, you know, uh, which was the case for me as well. And it wasn't about being, being black within media. It was about being from, not being from middle class or upper middle class, not being white, not being male, uh, being from a Muslim background, uh, being from a refugee background, all those things give you a certain perspective on the world that I didn't see within media. Mm -hmm. So um, 
that you know automatically uh, brings about a form of I wouldn't say friction, but you see gaps. You mm -hmm. know, you see things that are. Uh, very visible for you, but mm -hmm. very invisible, yeah. uh, or invisible for, yeah, for the others. We talk in this in this research project a lot about belonging and the word belonging. Yeah. And sometimes you feel like, okay, I do belong here, but in a way, I also see I don't. Yeah, it wasn't to me. It wasn't really about belonging because I had the best time. Let me tell you this: I I had an amazing time working for newspapers. Mm. I I was, you know, everything I wanted to do, I could do. Uh, I wrote about the continent that I'm from for about eight years. I traveled. It yeah, was, you traveled a lot. You wrote. About I traveled Africa. a lot. I had a lot of, you know, I wrote a book. Everything I wanted to do, I did. And then, so one of the reasons why I said yes was like, okay, I think I've kind of done everything I wanted to do, mm. uh, uh, but um, I also had, you know, in the meantime, had created my own vision on journalism. Mm -hmm. What uh, was your vision? Well, I couldn't really uh, articulate it back then. Yeah, I probably think. you could say it now yeah, in better so words than that. Right than now, them. it's it's been, you know, it's translated into our manifest, mm -hmm. uh, our 10-point manifest. Um, but back then, it was just the things that I did in practice, you know. Uh, so, for instance, so I wrote about, uh, I was the Africa editor for the newspaper, uh, being African myself, I'm from Ethiopia, there were certain things that I found very uh, uh, illogical mm -hmm. in the way of working. So, for instance, one of the rules I just made for myself was uh, I'm go only going to interview Africans about Africa. Now, that doesn't sound very revolutionary, but it was. Because if you think back at how uh, a lot of Africa reporting is being done from the West, yeah. uh, Africans appear, but they appear as, oh, sorry, uh, they appear as, um, they're part of the story as extras, you know, not the main characters, uh, not the people with knowledge, uh, not the people with solutions. Yeah, not the people who are actually sharing the story. Yeah, and determining the narrative. Mm. So um, you will have, you would have, um, you know, somebody from the International Crisis Group, which is based in Africa, but is mostly, you know, maybe right now it's changed. But back then it was mostly British people, French people, Italian people working there. Uh, so there's an immediate colonial <laughs> uh, lens mm -hmm. put on the news yeah, that we Yeah, it's a receive. Western translation. Sorry, there's a Western translation. Yeah, there. there's a Western filter over everything you 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 get. Publish, so, yeah. and uh, so that was one of the things that I didn't do. But then I would get criticized by colleagues from other newspapers. They were like, "Yeah, isn't that a bit biased?" You know, which is interesting because why is the Western perspective not biased? You know. If anything's biased, it that's is biased. The Western perspective. <laughs> exactly, because there is a certain interest in telling certain stories, uh, and all those politics that come along with the decision making in what you know, all the decision making before a production is published. You don't need to have like huge uh, like meetings about this. It's just something you either do or don't. You know. So I just decided, yeah, that's just my if. If I have to wait till like nine or ten in the evening to find that one professor uh, working at a university in Minnesota who was awake by then, who was of Somalian descent, to talk about piracy uh, from Somalia, then I'll do that. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it was, like I said, I had an amazing time, but I saw flaws and I saw things that I was doing alone. And One World gave me the opportunity because, you know, just I think a lot of people might not know that One World used to be a fully subsidized magazine before I, I came. Uh, it's yeah. not because it I started came. once it as started, a developing yeah, yeah. aid uh, yeah. magazine. It was a magazine focused on it was kind of like a you know specialized magazine in development aid. You, here we see, a, you know, an overview of the. The, the covers, uh, I don't know if this is visible for the people at home, but the covers uh, yeah. of, you know, way before. Mm -hmm. And from 2018 on, uh, I joined and a lot of things changed. For instance, the logo that uh, Remco will talk about yeah. later. Um, but um, so it was rooted in this actually very colonial uh, practice uh, of development aid. Um, but then I saw that, and I, you know, we used to get it at home. 
for free. It was a free magazine. And I was thought that it was sent to us because we were refugees and they wanted to show us how nice white people were with like, you know, helping Africans and stuff like that. <laughs> I really did think that. But it wasn't why we got... I don't know why. And my, ne- my dad never told me why we got why it at home. It. <laughs> because he wasn't working in development aid. But it was mostly for people in that sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, But through the years, even bef- before I came, it already made a, a change. And you can see that uh, throughout this, this uh, um, all these different covers, uh, yeah. that it became much more about injustice, not just far away, but also closer to home. It was about injustice in general, and not just, and also not just about Westerners helping people on the other side of the world. So I found that very interesting that they were able to make that shift. Yeah. You were seeing the change that you weren't seeing in other exactly. magazines I and media saw, outlets. Exactly, I saw space for evolution, yeah. right? So uh, when they when uh, People started telling me you should. There was an, a vacancy for for a chief editor, and I didn't even see that. But they, everyone was like, "You should go. You should mm-hmm. do that. You should." And I didn't even see myself in that position. But why didn't you see yourself in that position? Well, you know, patriarchy. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, I think we just we're not conditioned to think of ourselves as leaders, mm-hmm. to think of ourselves as you know the people in charge. Uh, but for me specifically. It's just because I'm. I don't really like to lead, to be honest. It doesn't. It might not seem that way, but I don't really like responsibility <laughs> that much. Because as a, you know, as a as a journalist, you're much of a you're a you're yeah, you're, you're a solo player. Yeah. You're so, but also you're a solo player. You know, you, you just you write your stories and you get your uh, your information and and you write and it's done. But you know, this is a much layered position i'm in you know you have to get other people to mm-hmm. do to write things. the stories but then again you you are also behind the wheels as in this is what we should write about exactly and that's but to get to that point it took me about a year and a half or two years to really formulate what it is i wanted to do mm-hmm. because when i started out i had all these ideas but to to actually formulate it and to translate it to other people so they understand the direction, they understand the course. And for instance, to brief uh, uh, a studio like Colorado to tell them this is the idea behind the logo, there's a lot of thought that goes and a lot of like uh, uh, just just on the go, you know, just getting things done and then seeing, you know, seeing the the pattern that you're you're laying. So part of it was already in my head. Part of it I had to figure out. And um, I think we finally found a formula um, that helps us be self-critical, transparent. Yeah. Um, this is actually the manifesto you're talking about, yeah. Well, yeah. because that makes it much easier to also share your vision with uh, with uh, with other other people. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're mentioning already a few, so. Maybe we can mention them all. Sure. Fair journalism, John. If you if you want to jump in on explaining some of the words, that's possible. Fair journalism. Well, What's this fair is actually journalism? well not fair. It's it's ju- it's just 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 journalism. Just, yeah. So that means that acknowledging the power within media. So we are so used to criticizing other systems, you know, criticizing politics, criticizing uh, companies everything outside of our own sector that I feel that there's, and I really see this as a design flaw or as a cultural flaw or I don't know, that there's very little space for self-criticism where you actually acknowledge we have a huge responsibility. We have, when it comes to language, when it comes to yeah. image, when it comes to underrepresented groups, I when it comes fair to... Fair language is also one of the one of the things in the manifest. Yeah, yeah. so just language. I wouldn't say fair. Yeah. What other people would call ex- inclusive, I don't like the word inclusive no. because it actually departs from the center, you know? So it still makes the center the center, and it's like... Oh, I'll I'll include you in everything I'm I'm doing. You know, I'll I'll include you in my own ways instead of saying the old ways are not right. You know, and uh, so there's a difference between. That's why I don't like inclusivity and diversity because it's mostly about getting people to you know like to join uh, a conversation that is already quite skewed or uh, that is not balanced or fair or. Um, and it's less about really changing things, and it's less about changing your ways of working and uh, re-examining what you're doing yeah. and why you're doing it. You know, what's the what's the end goal of what mm-hmm. you're doing? A lot of journalism, well, a lot of media, let me put it that way, isn't journalism, and a lot of journalism 
sometimes leans towards entertainment and leads towards so where do we what do we consider journalism and where is it about for me the you know the core of what we have to do is uh, it's about um, you know checking the powers that be even if it's our own power yeah. I'm going to ask you later about your exact definition of journalism um, John is there another part of the word of an, in the manifest that really pops out for you Yes, the, um, uh, the power structures. Yeah. So I um, believe the power question. I think um, that's that's one of the things that um, number four. Me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I know that. Um, <laughs> it's really funny that you're asking me about the uh, the one who uh, wrote it all is uh, sitting beside you. But, yeah, but um, uh, no. you're now also like <laughs> <laughs> you accepted the manifest, and now you have to preach it. <laughs> I know, MP, I know, I know. No, but this one is um, this is one is uh, for me uh, personally an important one because this is uh, even actually uh, uh, today is it's it's a big thing if you're talking about men versus women, if you're talking about black versus white, or uh, defying uh, t speaking truth to power. That's for me. Uh, um, uh, this one is all about. Yeah. Um, the manifest, it also really helps, uh, well, we just mentioned, share your story with other people. Uh, that story is also, we talk about, this is um, uh, designing cities for all. We talk about design a lot. Visual identity, I think that is a nice corner to you because uh, the manifest also helps telling the story, for example, to your uh, authors, to not only to the audience, but also to your authors, but Definitely. also to your designers. Definitely. And Remke, you're one of those designers um, because you already mentioned the visual identity of uh, One World that really changed throughout the years. Um, maybe we can uh, go to you because uh, we would love to hear something more about that visual identity. Um, what was the briefing that you uh, gave uh, Remco? And oh, by the way, Remco is part of Studio Colorado that you're not just by yourself, but together with Nina Fluitsma. Uh, what was part of the briefing that you once gave Remco and Nina? So I don't know if I re remember exactly, exactly that because you it's probably been a while. Knows. <laughs> yeah, it was a, I think it was towards the end of 2018 or was it in 2019? I don't know. So it's been a while, but... Uh, Part of the briefing was it has to be, uh, one word has to become much more of a, a, a title that is urgent, that, that has a, a sense of urgency or that, that uh, radiance, urgency, uh, bold, um, unapologetic, um, kind of in your face, you know. It used to be, a t because of the, you know, because of the history and because of the uh, transformation, but it wasn't, uh, the transformation wasn't complete. It was kind of like, it was a lot of things for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So was it an NGO, some people thought, or was it like... We yeah, have you a, wanted to have more focus. Yeah, we have a job board. Was it journalism? So it was many things to many people. We wanted to say, we are a title that centers journalism yeah. and that centers um, uh, injustice. And we need to see that translated or justice, you know. Yeah. So that um, was the brief. Both of them need to be translated in our logo. And um, yeah, so yeah. was that... Uh, Close Close to maybe what you first, remember? Yeah, maybe first also Studio Colorado because you're not only working uh, for for One World. Maybe we can show a few of your other work first and then go to the story of One World. Can you explain? We have some images. Can you explain what we're seeing right now? Yeah, we. Um, I'm Studio Colorado together with Nina Fluitsma. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she cannot be here, but um, I want to say that she's the real design powerhouse of our studio. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh, since five years, we uh, work on for clients like Dekmantel Festival, uh, Museum Boymans van Beuningen, uh, Rijnwaard Academy, uh, the study about mm -hmm. uh, cultural heritage, and um, for World Press Photo Foundation, for example, all really interesting clients. And I think it was in 2018 or 19, maybe it took a year, <laughs> the it briefing. Took a long time. <laughs> that uh, One World uh, came to us with a question uh, of redesigning the... Visual the identity. identity. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, Saada summed it up quite well. Um, during the years uh, before, the, the identity was... Uh, it was not that clear anymore where One World came from, where it stand, stood for. 
and also the layout of the magazine be, was um, it looked good, but it was not clear what it what it was trying to say. Um, and I think uh, one important thing f of the briefing was to make uh, people uh, proud about the magazine, uh, the uh, owners, but also the uh, um, s subscribers, yeah. to um, be part of uh, be part of that uh, world mm -hmm. and be recognizable for everyone. Yeah. Um, so that w it was an important um, thing to, to, to try to understand what's, what is the identity of One World, not even the visual identity, but what is yeah. One World about. And uh, the second thing to, to give that, uh, to try to, to give that a, a, a graphic design. Mm -hmm. so on How the did screen, you start it? <coughs> yeah, yeah, on the screen, uh, uh, maybe we can share it. Um, these are some small lines that were uh, that we took out of the briefing too. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe we can translate them. It says one world, one world. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> in Dutch, in Yeah. Uh, nothing uh, is on its own. Uh, one world investigates all the cross connections and it's never or, or it's always end end. Yeah, these are four s uh, small sentences. One world is not even a sentence, but it, we, we just thought of what does the brand mean, one world. Uh, what exactly mean, does that mean? We have to share one world with, with everybody. The other three sentences were put across in the briefing, just like part of uh, a paragraph, but we took the little sentences out and this became a starting point for, the, for creating the concept. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, nothing is on its own, is that the right English uh, translation? Or exists on yeah. its own. Exists on yeah. its own. Or not an island, yeah. yeah. So um, I think what One World does is uh, always uh, look at f from different angles to, uh, to a story, to a subject. Um, so uh, this little sentence was, uh, was symbolic for it. If we can it go was to the, the starting point, that right? was the starting point, so if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, we, um, we used the two O's that are in the, in the brand to to show that uh, yeah there's only one world and that we have to share that one so it is possible to cut it in half <laughs> it is also possible to put it in the beginning but but then we have an empty hole in the in the second uh, part mm -hmm. um, and if we go to the next slide we we it, this became like a system to 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 create more uh, logos yeah, you played it's, with it's different logos, uh, versions system, yeah so. On the different covers, we use different logos, and on the website, it's it's animated, uh, different versions. Um, oh, so just like the world, you're in a constant it's, state it's of flux. It's evolving. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and did also, if we can go one slide back, the um, um, in the briefing it said like one world doesn't have one voice. I think that also connects with what Saada was t uh, saying about. Uh, we don't include something into one center. Uh, we want to show the different voices that are also around that center. So uh, I think the different logos are um, mimicking that ID. Um, nice. Yeah. So, so oh, so this is one. You brought this is one, one magazine. of the versions. Yeah. yeah. This is so not the latest cover, visible. but the cover before. Yeah. This so this is just one version. Oh. What? <laughs> We don't have the, la the latest. Uh, we don't yeah, have we do yeah, have. Yeah, we do have it. In the, so we have, we an have image. it on screen. Obviously, yeah, but <laughs> it's actually the same. It's yep. uh, this time we use the same logo for two uh, two times. Oh, John has it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, here are the last uh, yeah. two uh, covers of last year. Uh, if we go one slide back or forth, we have three more of the year before. And then you see more uh, yeah. of the logo system. And one other uh, important um, element of the identity is that we mainly use black and white. That's, I think, uh, part of bec becoming or making it more urgent. Um, the, yeah, the black and white is really a strong uh, uh, color combination. Mm -hmm. And by using quite a lot of white, we, we, we do our best to keep parts of the magazine white. <laughs> Saada 
does her best to put as much <laughs> content, <laughs> content in as yeah. possible. Words, but yeah. by uh, trying to keep it wide and open, uh, we try to make it to keep it accessible too. So, so every yeah, so and with accessible, accessible for everybody. Yeah, because yeah. what uh, who are you uh, uh, taking into account when you leave a lot of blank space? Uh, I would say everybody, um, because uh, the um, writers they really they try to say they want to say as much as possible, but if uh, the, the, I think there was a bit of a problem before and still it's uh, a discussion going on. If you put too much information in the magazine or in, in an article, yeah. it also becomes cluttered and less yeah. clear and what you you're trying And you make it more readable for people with, for example, dyslexia yeah. or... Uh, yeah. We already made the font bigger. Yeah. It was v much smaller, yeah. right? Yeah. So that was also part that's of accessibility. We all because uh, need one. We exactly. Age, so that's nice. Yeah. yeah. But it's just nice for everybody, to be honest. Yeah. You know, a lot of improvements are actually that seem like an improvement for just one group are mm -hmm. eventually usually an improvement for everybody. No, that's what we say, right? If you design for one specifically, then it's yeah. often better for all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there more things in the visual identity that I can uh, relate to the manifest? Um, can we see the manifest? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, well, to me, if you ask me, so, so all these, so the, va the variation in logos, I thought that was super smart because what did, what Remco didn't say is that it was actually a bidding by you know different uh, studios uh, proposed um, things and you know there stood out so you know so much because it was such because a because you felt they understood the values exactly yeah uh, we definitely understood that they they really read it at a level where we at the same level as we uh, uh, would translate it into articles so um, and it was very very different from what it was so it was that's what we wanted we wanted it not to be like anything that it used to be um you know and how the black and white kind of forces us to use very strong uh, photography and illustrations and lots of like bold colors mm -hmm. um and uh, that's also you know uh, uh good for the visual side for like for briefing uh, photographers because that used to be i thought kind of you know it wasn't bad, but it was kind of feeble, you know. Mm -hmm. and it, so I brought it into the into 2020, whatever. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think uh, and and the fact that we the 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 font is also quite in your face, you know, just like the logo, but also you know if you look at the headlines. Mm -hmm. um, so you could perceive that as harsh, but it's also to me, it's also about. Um, not beating around the bush, yeah. you know, being clear. being clear and being, uh, like I said, unapologetic about what you're writing. So, for instance, here is a very interesting. Uh, this was a story on language, actually, and it was, you know, what uh, Nina actually, who's who's behind a lot of these um, uh, designs within the magazine, uh, she also uh, kind of some of the things that we write about are so. Um, if you would put that in images, it would become so cliche mm -hmm. because this was about how do we describe yeah, because developing language and exactly. the visuals work together. Exactly. So you pr either perpetuate uh, perpetuate uh, 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 stigmas and cliches, or you turn it around. So here, this was about how do we write about developing economies, just that word, you mm -hmm. know, or, or developing countries or, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, about uh, the global south or what are all these terms that we have and where should we go to? So what she did was she kind of threw them in our face by making them really big. And and this was actually an image that um, I don't know who found it. Was it Nina or somebody? It was Nina, right? This is an, an image by an Ethiopian uh, artist from 2004 that she let us use for free. This happens a lot, that people are just happy to, to you know, to contribute or to be in one world. Yeah, also because probably the story exactly. you want to tell is the story they want they to tell with tell. their yeah, art. Yeah, they find so. it important. Um, and this was like, uh, she kind of scrambled the, the, the world maps uh, and, and made a different world, you know? So it comes back to, so a lot of the concepts come back to image uh but even things like so this story doesn't even have a headline mm -hmm. all these big words are the headlines so that's also about you know layers and how things are com complex sometimes you can't just capture it in one word or one sentence mm -hmm. um so yeah it's really nice to see how that works together yeah. 
because so I there are two words uh, Dimfi, yeah uh, of course that, I, that came up to mind is um, transparency yeah probably um, also uh, one of the words in the yeah, <laughs> number 10 <laughs> number 10 hey repres uh, representation I think that that's one of the things that I, what I really love about uh, about one, one world because yeah I can I can see myself or other people can identify themselves within the stories that are in uh, in the concept yeah what are you uh, most happy about uh, right now with how the magazine looks uh, Remco? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, that, that the whole identity is um, it, it's it all uh, relates to each other so the uh, website relates to the magazine and the uh, cover relates to the articles and it all has the same starting point um, for example the, the the sharp cutting in the in, in the logo how we how we cut the O uh, in two we use that in the layout too uh, the uh, uh, pages are cut in two or four and we use one part for an image and another part for the title or we keep it white for uh, readability um, and Coming from that logo, we also created patterns. That, uh, that's what I wanted uh, to add. Um, because that was also one other thing in the briefing that the, subject, the subjects can be uh, pretty heavy and also the way of writing can sometimes be a bit heavy. Uh, um, so that's why we um, brought in these patterns to give it some almost more light um, feel to the to the whole uh, magazine mm. so i think um yeah i think that it's the balance of all these elements that that i think work out uh, well yeah. yeah and the patterns are cut out from the are parts of the logo yeah so they're elements of yeah so it's, it's kind it's of like a story yeah and it's also very like it's recycling of a you yeah. know it's like reusing a certain thing to create something else uh -huh. it's great to see how much there is to say about just like the visual identity and the images uh, only um i'm gonna make a jump uh, because of time uh, mm -hmm. restrictions, I'm going to make a jump to your uh, fellowship already because this is actually going to be one of the topics that we are going to discuss in next episodes. Um, but before I'm asking you about that fellowship and the contents of it, I have one question actually from the audience, um, and that is to you because uh, someone wants to know, do you decide together with Nina the design for each article separately? Uh, sorry? Do you decide together with Nina the design for each article separately? So that actually, I think what they want to ask is, do you have like a fixed frame or are you like reading every article and then we start, make the design? We, I, uh, we actually start with, with, with a fixed uh, frame. But yeah, then, you have some design elements, yeah, but then obviously. We, uh, we have to um, uh, play around with it because while designing the magazine, they're changing a lot all the time. And one article goes out, another <laughs> one comes in. Uh, uh, one becomes a cover story with one uh, more spread. So it's it's a very fluid, organic have to be process. Made. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, it's like in, in a couple of weeks it it, it comes together, but. Um, I think in the past it, there were a bit more templates for different types of ar articles, but mm -hmm. uh, and we so we reuse the templates a bit, but we also ad adjust what whatever is we think is needed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're gonna take a look at much more images uh, later on in the in the process um, because let's talk about the fellowship. Um, yeah. Part of designing cities for all is that we involve other people, other fellows, other experts uh, to take a deep dive with us in uh, uh, certain things they are already investigating and working on um, and uh, making it more of a sort of a public research. Um, with you, we're going to organize three more uh, live casts starting on February 28. What are we going to investigate? Redesigning journalism, we have called it. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're kind of ambitious, but <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's actually, I think uh, I'd like to get the conversation going within journalism uh, about how we can do things differently. So 
for instance, we are already doing things differently than a lot of other media. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're already there. You know, we still have gaps and questions and things that uh, we, we are, you know, we are confronted with our limitations or, uh, you know, you Can have you ideals, but, you know, it might not always work. Can you give an example of that, a recent example? Or maybe John has one? Uh, well, I think there are different... Well, One of the things I forgot to mention, because you asked me what is... I, I often forget to mention that, but it's actually important, uh, is that uh, end of 2020, uh, Wormworld was actually... Well, the magazine had stopped. Uh, all the contracts of all the employees had been um, um, terminated. terminated. And, um, uh, well, that's when... Myself and John jumped in and said, we'd like to take over if that's possible, because we think it's important what we're building here, right? So the manifest had just been uh, around for not even a year mm -hmm. back then. And, you know, we were already on this course that we wanted to keep, you know, pursuing and seeing what, you know, what that brings and how that it was still a work in progress. And mm -hmm. it still is. Actually. Yeah, you had to redesign yourself, actually, exactly. as a magazine. Exactly. So I'd like to invite other media to talk about how we can redesign media in the sense that uh, or redesign journalism, because media is something else. Mm -hmm. But what is what is the difference, according to you, between journalism me and media? Media is more like the, the container Uh, where you have entertainment and, uh, you know, uh, gossip and mm -hmm. uh, social media and whatever. And probably also advertising. Advertising. Is that media too, John? Yeah, that's media too. <laughs> I, see, I see John not. not that's his sad. department. Sad. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, but for me, journalism is, like I said, is at, at its core, it's about, um, uh, it's about, um, you know, checking power structures and fighting injustice that to me is journalism there's a lot of other things going on within journalistic titles you know that is also entertainment and that is like you know human interest or whatever so one of the things that we don't do for instance is we don't interview politicians about their pets like some TV hosts do you know we don't do those things because to me that has nothing to do with how you should speak to politicians, you mm -hmm. know, or what about. I mean, what they do, in the, they're still human, but what they do in their free time has nothing to do with what we as journalists should be interested in, to me. But um, having said that, uh, so redesigning, we, we've redesigned, try to redesign ourselves and we're still in the process of re redesigning ourselves and we're getting closer and closer to what we'd like to do uh, but I'd like to have that conversation with other media um, I think we are seen as uh, inspirational even though they might not admit that there's a lot of copying going on uh, without crediting but that's fine uh, but um, but there's not a, a conversation where they include us or ask us Uh, you know, how can we do things differently instead of, you know, like going through the motions and just copying each other. And, you know, I'd like to get a more of a spark going mm -hmm. in, in journalism. Not to say that there isn't a lot of good journalist, uh, a lot of good journalism. Yeah, and uh, things are happening from, because we see, I think you are one of the first also to, when we talk about uh, language, um, For example, you were one of the first that actually published a whole article about, okay, this is not language we're going to use uh, yeah, anymore, and this exactly. is the reason. Please feel inspired and uh, yeah, join us. Well, we actually that and also it, see that that is also a continuous search. Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't even a call to action. It was mostly like this is just a message to our readers and mm -hmm. to our, our freelancers that this is the way we're we going are going to move do this. forward. We are going to do this, and it actually uh, resulted in other media. First, getting angry, which is always is the same kind of process, right? First, they get mad, and then they're like, hmm, maybe it's interesting, well, and then it's the and part then of they being have being uncomfortable, yeah, with and then what they have the do. conversation within themselves, and then which realizing, is, yeah, and then or maybe just saying, well, we're going to do this now, and then not even talking about the backstory or how you got there. I think it's very important to include the audience in how you made these decisions and why, uh, so that, and this is not just to me. The, there is a real necessity to do this yeah. because there's more and more distrust towards media 
um, and this is something mainstream media complain about, but they don't examine how that happened. They don't examine what, how do we come to this point where people don't, uh, people kind of question things that are coming from us. Why are we not seen as reliable sources anymore? Um, and I think, I think that com that comes back to, to the just to finish that that comes back to the to the question to the um, uh, to the to the problem that media don't have a system to criticize media. Mm. I, I think this is John because I see you wanted to uh, add something to this. This is also the part that you find really interesting, right? Like. It's about gatekeeping, and that was the reason why I wanted to add. Uh, to, uh, was because I think that yeah. that's. Is Can you explain what gatekeeping uh, is? <laughs> well, in the uh, in the podcast uh, next week, we could probably. Ah, good go that you mentioned it already. It. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, uh, for me, I make the analogy to uh, the bouncer. You know, I want to get into the club, and this the filter who uh, uh, lets you in or who won't let you in. I think that kind of filtering that's. That's one of the reasons why uh, I believe that there is a part of distress as well. There are not different kind of perspectives or not enough different kind of perspectives. So it looks like it's already been, uh, um, uh, it's really been clear uh, what kind of uh, um, stories are, are going to get out there. So I think it's uh, selection and filtering. That's the first thing that pops up in, into my mind. Yeah. The uh, fellowship. So we're going to uh, invite other speakers uh, also to discuss these topics uh, with us. Um, the first one is on February 28th. It's about uh, language. Uh, what are we going to ask them? Well, um, I'm curious as to how other titles, um, uh, what type of discussions are being held ab about language and uh, use of words and terminology, uh, accessibility, um, but also who decides how we're going to name certain things mm -hmm. or which words we're going to use. For instance, you know, The Guardian had, uh, um, the British newspaper had a... Uh, they made a decision at some point, I think in, two th I don't know, 2019 or something, where they were like, uh, listen, we're not going to be talking about climate change anymore. That is way too much of a euphemism for what's going on. So we're, we're going to use the word climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in what type of conversations uh, were held before that decision and yeah. who decides that? Is this a, you know, is there a survey yeah, it held has a, amongst has readers? It has a different uh, sound to it, right? feels much more urgent. Of course. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a political decision they made, right? So I think it's that's almost, a, it's an activist stand, right? F where they're like, okay, if, for instance, Nu.nl, which is a huge uh, um, online free, outlet. Yeah, yeah online outlet. Um, uh, you know, it's for the general public. It's not very specialized. They decided to say, uh, they d uh, I think they decided we're not going to give platform to uh, people who um, deny the climate crisis anymore. Mm. You know, before this, there was a lot of both sides uh, uh, reporting going on where you would have somebody who believed climate change was yeah. real and somebody who believed it wasn't real. And we, they would butt heads. And that was, you know, a lot of the publications were that type of productions. Uh, so they decided we're not going to do that yeah. anymore. And I'd in a like way, to it know sounds like okay, now you're not neutral, but on the other hand, it's also well. That's facts, one of the right? points in the manifest as well. Neutrality doesn't exist, yeah. you know. So objectivity doesn't exist. So I'd rather have. Uh, it's it's quite uncommon in Dutch media. That's why we are mostly seen as you know weird or active. I'm often called an activist when I'm. You a don't journalist. see it as activism. No, I, I th well. I think a lot of journalism is activism. You know, it comes from um, being surprised or being angry or being, you know, being confronted with things that aren't right. Right? That's that's the starting point of a lot of uh, journalistic, um, you know, um, searching for the truth mm -hmm. or truth finding. So. Um, I guess that is a form of activism. You know, it doesn't really matter from which angle you start. Um, but in my case, it's often used to disqualify. It's not used to uh, um, 
to look at the end goal or to look at the production or the quality of the production. It's mostly used to say, well, she's not a real journalist. She's actually, you know, she's kind of like, um, I don't know. Anyway, but... No, but let's, let's have not that as like our starting point. Then the exactly, and for me, it's interesting to to also uh, disclose the the things that go on behind the scenes in journalism. That's why I think it's important to have these conversations, yep. because for a lot of people, I think it's this enigma, this machine that pumps out you know information, but nobody knows what's going on behind the yeah, scenes. Yeah, the mechanism. And yeah, and the conversations and the decision yeah. making and the and the difficulty. It's a very difficult yeah. profession. It's not a difficult. I'm not trying to startle people. No, but please that's also join. what we're going to ask other people. But and, it's a, but and it's please a hard, join us as well. Yeah, but it's but it's there's a there's a lot of work and thinking. I hope, mm -hmm. but I know because I've also worked at uh, you know the the bigger titles, but um, that goes into uh, something that is then you know the audience only sees the output, but the input is very important. Yeah. I think we should have openness about those. Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to discuss actually in the third conversation uh, on March 28. And then we have a second one on March 14, mm -hmm. which is more about uh, visuals and uh, image. Um, well, we already discussed some of that uh, before. Uh, maybe I can ask you, why are images so important? And that's the first thing you see when you <coughs> open the magazine or when you uh, open a website. So it, it immediately gives you a certain state of mind. So I think um, what we try to yeah, do... Yeah, I think you can change the whole context of an article with just like yeah. picking the yeah. good or wrong yeah. picture. So I, I think uh, that that's what we... That's always part of the process to find uh, the right images that or bring something extra to the story or, or show uh, a different angle or uh, at least are not cliche, are not, uh, we really avoid cliche and, and, and images with too much uh, meaning already. Mm -hmm. So we yeah, try to make it a, a good sum together with the, the text. Well, we're going to talk about that in the second one. So to sum up, Language, February 28, images, March 14, and changing the newsroom, March 28. Um, so we hope you will all uh, join us this next editions. This was just like the kickoff. We already covered a lot of topics. Uh, John already mentioned it. Maybe he can make the promo himself. John, the podcast, the Pakhuis is like a podcast is going online. When? Uh, this coming Thursday, right? Yes. It's true. So if you want to know more about uh, uh, the fellowship uh, of One World and about uh, a lot of the things they already mentioned today, um, you can check the podcast of Pakhuis de Zwijger, uh, which will be published through all social media channels on uh, thirst, uh, Thursday, so upcoming Thursday. Um, for now, I really want to thank you both for being in the studio with us, John joining us via Zoom. Hopefully, we will have you in the studio with us next time. Um, I do have a few more mention, things to mention before we are going to wrap this uh, edition up, uh, because one is the book club. Um, we have a Designing Cities for All book club, and the next one is uh, happening in, uh, let me see, in February. Yes, and this is the book we're going to discuss, A Place to S Stay, and we're doing that together with uh, Shaira Viv. Uh, she's one of the co-founder of the Voorkamer in Utrecht, and uh, it's about embedded design in practice. Um, so she gives you a perspective on uh, a more creative, unique design research method with an eye for the environment. So if you want to join us, you uh, can get a book. Uh, it's for upcoming designers and design students. Um, you can apply on the website of dezwijger.nl uh, and you can enroll until January 28th. That's upcoming Friday. Uh, uh, yes, January 28th. Um, in the meantime, because we are back with One World in by the end of February, in the meantime, uh, you can also uh, join our DCF DCFA series on creating cultures of care. And that's a triptych starting on January 31. And in the first edition, we will focus on the concept of the caring city um, with the writer of the upcoming book, uh, The Caring City. Um, also joining us is Lior Steinberg, uh, urban planner and uh, 
we're going to talk with a disability expert, April Ranshuizen, about the UN Convention on the Rights of People. Um, and the good news is you can join us live in the studio. So please, uh, if you're able to, come join us live in the studio, and else you can also watch it online. Podcast, we already mentioned that, next Thursday. Um, and then we will start on February 28th with the live cast of uh, uh, One World. And if you want to become a member, uh, because we haven't even discussed that, if I want to have a membership in One World, where should I go? www.oneworld.nl And just, you know, Slash there's a huge, near. <laughs> there's this huge button on the top of the, uh, of the homepage where you can just uh, subscribe and... Um, you know, receive an amazing magazine that is uh, designed with care and uh, yes. and written with care and, and a lot of love. And I think it's important for people to realize that all this, like I said, this distrust in media, uh, uh, you know, um, it also means that you have to support independent, and I didn't even mention the only black-owned magazine in this country um, by me and John, um, uh, you should support that if you want, uh, you know, if you want this, this, um, uh, you know, to still to remain a, a pluriform uh, landscape, media yeah. landscape. So if you want to help change the world, yeah, and, and it's really support affordable. One world. Yeah. And while you add it, you we can keep, also we keep it affordable. Yeah. yeah. And while you add it, you can also support Pakhaj Desweiger. Go to desweigernl slash well, this Desweiger.nl. I already heard the end tune, so let's start it. We will see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you.